And I want to bring on Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim, are you there? Can we bring you on? I'm hoping he's there. I think I saw him earlier. Dr. Kim, come in, Dr. Kim. Well, hopefully we'll dig up uh, Dr. Kim. Do we got him? Okay. Yes, I'm here. There you are, Dr. Kim. Hey, buddy. So. Hey, how is everyone? I, I, hey, I'm doing good. I know that you were even offering to come over here. I'm happy you're not here because we're, of course, doing quarantine. I met Dr. Kim because I went in and I did a, um, a, a prostate blood test about a year and about two years ago. I think that's where we met, right? That's Tim right. Mudd brought me in. And what kind of test did I do? It was a PSA blood test for prostate cancer screening. Yeah. And it was non-invasive. And thank God it came out. I was, I'm in great shape. Most of us guys during this time, this is a good time for us to take care of ourselves, right, Doc? Absolutely. Because, you know, the coronavirus is going to come and go, but we still need to be healthy and we're going to still function in, in, in our spheres. And you're at Cedar sinai correct? That's correct. Tell us about the, the, the ward or the group that you are part of. Yeah, so um, Ken, I have some slides. Should I bring them up now or later? Yeah, let, let, let's do some slides. Let's go through those slides. Okay. So you got to go share your screen. I got it. All right, Dr. Kim. Let's see what you got. All right. Just got a lot up. of stuff there. You're going to stuff, stuff but, uh, in about you, 10 you, minutes. You, okay, gave me, you, gave me, uh, you gave me 30 minutes, but uh, I'll try to, I can go a lot faster. But, All right, let's um, try it faster. Yeah, so, you know, just to give you a little background, we were planning this um, little presentation about uh, two months ago. A lot has happened since then. Uh, the world has changed. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on what's happening um, at work for me. So while most of you guys are at home, I'm actually going to work every single day. Um, I go in at seven and I often don't come home till six o'clock. And, you know, we're trying to flatten the curve. Um, and so you can see what happens it happened in China and what's happening everywhere else in the world. Uh, this comes from Johns Hopkins and it, it was um, up to date as of yesterday. And um, uh, in the hospital, what we're experiencing is nothing, uh, it's, it's unlike anything I've ever seen before, of course. Um, uh, so let me give you three quick anecdotes. Um, I did two surgeries on Friday. Cancer surgeries are not considered elective, so those are still going forward. Uh, usually I, the patients wait in the family waiting area because they can't wait in the waiting area. They're, they're sitting in their cars for three, four hours while the surgery is taking place. It's actually uh, crazy. Um, the, uh, I have a, a resident doctor who's still in training. These guys don't make a lot of money. They literally make minimum wage. And she's got two small kids at home. And um, uh, she's worried because her, her parents and her in-laws are the ones that take care of these kids during the day. And uh, if she brings the coronavirus home, the kids can get it, but they're, they're okay, but they may pass it on to the grandparents. And she's, uh, you know, if they have a 15% mortality rate, it, it's, it's very dangerous for them. So she's actually going home to a hotel. Um, she's worried that her husband's gonna get laid off and they require two incomes. Uh, and, um, uh, and despite that financial worry, she's, She's going to a hotel to keep her family safe. Um, the nurses and doctors uh, that are taking care of the coronavirus patients at Cedar sinai don't have the optimal respiratory protection. So the N95 masks are what you really need, uh, but um, uh, we're, most of them are actually going, uh, going into these patient rooms with surgical masks uh, that are not, um, uh, true respiratory, uh, respiratory uh, protections. So it's, it's, uh, it's a trying time. Um, I think uh, if you see people in the healthcare profession, you know, uh, give them a shout out because they're literally putting themselves and their family on the line. Um, I am a little less affected because I'm a urologist and I work sort of in a different area, but um, 
certainly the primary care doctors and nurses, um, they're really um, stepping it up. So a couple of quick slides. You know, so much of what's coming from the government, even from the CDC, is clouded by politics. And it's also clouded by practical issues. We have a lack of masks. But if you look at this paper that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine last week, what you see is that the, um, the titers in the aerosol, so you cough and the virus goes into the air and it stays in the air for over three hours. They only, they, they stop measuring at three hours and the vi viral titers are still high. This is a top medical journal. This paper came out on Tuesday. The CDC recommendations haven't caught up to it. So if you see patient pictures of people in China with masks on, they actually got it right. So we were actually, you know, the government was doing the best they can with the information they had, but scientific data is now finally starting to come on. And it's interesting to learn that this virus It'll persist in the air. It persists on surfaces for several days. And uh, this is stuff that we didn't quite recognize earlier. Here's a paper that hasn't even been published yet, but it's available in a preprint form. It's been peer reviewed. It's coming out in the top uh, GI journal. And it shows that coronavirus um, can infect the GI system. So this is what in medical, um, field we call fecal oral transmission. So this is something that was not previously recognized. This is a paper that came out of China and from their experience and 42% of patients had respiratory symptoms only. Look at this, 45% had respiratory and digestive symptoms, meaning they had diarrhea. And what's scary is a, a couple, some patients, a small number of patients had digestive symptoms only, and then 10% of patients had no symptoms. So this is the kind of information that we didn't really have. And we only thought that this was spread by respiratory droplets and by- Wait, wait real quick, Dr. Uh, Kim, wait, wait, the di wait, wait are, you, are you saying diarrhea is part of this now? It is. Yeah. Because that was one of the jokes was it doesn't cause diarrhea. It now is, you're saying it does. This is a paper that is, you can, you can now find a paper up because it's been peer reviewed, but it hasn't been formally published yet. So this is, this is information that's coming on in real time and that's going to affect the CDC recommendations. And then this is something that we've known for a while now, the incubation period. So for most people, uh, they develop symptoms five days after, their, um, uh, after they've gotten coronavirus and after they've started becoming contagious. And so what do you do if you're infected? Well, so this is a paper that shows how long the virus persists in people who have been infected. So if you look at these curves from the day that, they're, um, uh, that they've uh, become infected, you can see that the viral titers uh, are starting to come down and most patients are no longer infectious after about two weeks. So the thing that's uh, very recently changed with um, uh, the recommendations in LA County is that if you have symptoms and coronavirus is suspected, they're telling you not to get tested unless the test results are somehow going to change what you're doing. Since all of us are staying home and we're essentially quarantined anyways, uh, the testing isn't really changing your management. So uh, even if you try to get a, a test in, in the emergency room, they're not going to do it uh, because of that new recommendation. Uh, so the question then is, you know, how long should you quarantine yourself and avoid uh, contacts? And this, this is, uh, again, from the New England Journal of Medicine, the top medical journal, uh, showing that most people are infectious for about two weeks. So it's, I just wanted to pass on some practical information that's directly relevant to what's going on with the coronavirus before we talk about our favorite topic, the prostate. Good stuff, Doc. I appreciate that. Okay, I'll make this quick. <clears throat> so the prostate is this little um, gland. Every man has it. It sits underneath the bladder uh, and urine has to flow through it. As men get older, the prostate enlarges. So 
when you become an adult, all your body parts stop growing uh, except the prostate. So the older you are, the bigger the prostate gets. So um, when the prostate enlarges, unfortunately, a couple of things happen. The volume of urine that the bladder can store decreases. The amount of urine that may be left over, even after you urinate, uh, starts to increase. And as the bladder thickens in order to try to compensate for all these changes, the bladder starts to have involuntary spasms. So even if the bladder is not full, if it's having a spasm, the body interprets that as a need to urinate. So frequent urination uh, is a um, uh, problem that most men will eventually experience. So some of the older men in, uh, in the audience, you may know all about this. Um, the younger men have this to look forward to. Here's a link, you can go to this link and um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna do it, but you can answer a questionnaire and see how severe your symptoms are. If your symptoms of score that this uh, questionnaire generates is over 13, then you have symptomatic uh, BPH. And this is how we grade the um, symptoms. We're not gonna do that today. Um, but what drives treatment? So the question I always ask patients is, if you have trouble urinating, is this affecting your quality of life? So the way quality of life is affected is you start waking up two or three times at night and your sleep is interrupted and you're tired during the day. So remember when you were young, there was a time when you could sleep the entire night. Then as you get older, if you're waking up three or four times a night, that's a problem. The other play, um, way this affects quality of life is you can't delay your urination. So let's say you're in a car, you're driving, there's no bathroom nearby. And if you can't delay your urination comfortably for 30 minutes, you get into all kinds of situations that are sort of uh, uh, abnormal. So you may be pulling off the road to find a bathroom. You, you're in public, there's no bathroom, and that becomes almost a panic situation. So when quality of life is affected, you start medications. Um, there are three different classes of medications. I'm not going to go into it, but alpha blockers are the... Um, primary uh, treatment provides about 70% of the relief that medications can provide. And when you start these medications, what you'll see is a change in that score, the symptom score by about seven points. So those of you who want to go to that link that I gave you um, on your own free time, uh, generate your score, and then know that if you start medications, your score should drop by about seven points. And that can help you decide, hey, is this gonna be helpful for me or not? Of course, if uh, medications aren't enough, the next step is to actually do surgery. Um, again, I'm gonna skip this because it's probably more information than you want. And, uh, but what you should know is that if you do surgery, depending on the type of operation you do, uh, you're, the score, that symptom score that I referred to earlier should drop by 15 points if you have a surgery called a TERP and nine points if you drop, uh, if you have surgery uh, known as a Urolift. And this is based on, you know, randomized clinical trials. So Ken, I can stop here or I can talk a little bit about prostate cancer in five minutes. What do you want? Uh, God, man, this stuff's so fascinating to me. You can, can you do another five minutes? I'll do it in five minutes. Okay, five okay. minutes. All right, so, um, you know, my first job was at Roswell Park Cancer Institute. This is in Buffalo, New York. And that gentleman whose picture is shown there is Michu, and he invented PSA. So I got to meet and work with him at Roswell Park. You know, I went out to Buffalo because that was a place where I can go, and I was literally the only fellowship trained cancer center in all of Western New York. So I had an uh, experience there that was second to none, being the main cancer guy, literally one of the uh, busiest uh, cancer surgeons in the country. And um, uh, it was there that I got my experience in taking care of prostate cancer. It's not what I do. Um, um, it's not the only thing I do, but it is one of the things I take care of. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, uh, PSA. It's a blood test 
uh, that can screen for prostate cancer. And as the prostate enlarges in all men, the PSA does go up, but cancer causes it to go up a little bit more quickly. So the way to look for prostate cancer is to do an exam and check your um, blood test for the PSA. The US government actually recommends that men between the ages of 55 and 69 should consider getting a PSA test and get it every other year, but they don't endorse it with the grade A recommendation. They give it a grade C recommendation. I just wanna explain real quickly why that is. So there were two large studies that randomly assigned literally hundreds of thousands of men to either surgery uh, or, or to um, uh, screening or no screening. And then they asked the question, which group lives longer? And the bottom line is the American study said that uh, men do not need screening. And the European study concluded that men should get screening. And um, I want you to really understand the controversy here because this affects your decision and whether you're gonna go get a blood test looking for prostate cancer. In the American study, here's what happened. Uh, patients are told, hey, there's a research study. We're looking to see if prostate cancer screening with the blood test helps you or not. And uh, they said, if you join the study, you're gonna ra get randomly assigned to get a PSA test or not. And so the, uh, the, the group that got assigned to uh, PSA screening, of course, had their PSA checked. The group that did not get assigned to PSA screening then went to their primary care doctor and said, hey, I was turned down for prostate cancer screening with the PSA. And the primary care doctor would then say, well, I can order it for you. So what they, when they went back and looked at the study, they found that this is a line uh, for the patients who uh, actually had intervention, PSA screening, almost 90%, which is uh, good. And then the patients that were in the control group, by the end of the study, almost all of them had their PSA checked, but outside the uh, study, but it was done likely through their primary care doctor. So it really wasn't a study between screening and not screening, but this unfortunately was the test that uh, drove the decision by the um, US Preventative Services Task Force not to recommend screening. If you look at the European study, you can see that the screening group did have a lower risk of death. And so in Europe, when patients are told don't get a blood test with their nationalized healthcare system, they actually don't. Uh, and so uh, the European study is the more um, accurate study when you're looking at uh, um, the benefit of PSA-based blood tests looking for prostate cancer. There is a reason why you might not want to do this though. Uh, the reason prostate cancer screening can do harm is that the treatments that we currently have can cause urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction. And so, uh, yes, there is, a, there is a downside to screening. The way to mitigate that is to <clears throat> be more selective in how, how you treat. This is a link. You guys can look at it later on. It'll take you to a uh, risk calculator, the best one that's available out there. You can put your PSA and personal information in, and it'll give you your percent likelihood of having prostate cancer, the low risk kind and the high risk kind. If anyone has any trouble interpreting these results, uh, email me or text me. I'm happy to help you guys uh, understand it. Um, many of you may have already done a lot of these things through your uh, personal doctors anyways. So if you have an abnormal PSA, just know that the next step is a biopsy. This is literally how it's done. A probe's put into your rectum, a needle's put into your prostate through your rectum. So just understand that uh, you know, the next step could be something like this. Uh, hopefully none of you have to uh, experience this, but the key is to figure out who's most likely to die from prostate cancer, and you have to reduce the risk of treatment. So, um, I'm not going to get into what we're doing to try to uh, um, make PSA screening more sensible um, and how we address these two uh, issues, but have me back and happy to talk to you more about those. But let me jump to the last slide. Bottom line message for you guys, uh, everyone's prostate enlarges and quality of life 
uh, effect should dictate whether you get treated or not, whether it's with medication and surgery. Prostate cancer screening with PSA makes sense if you are going to risk stratify so that not everyone gets treated exactly the same way. And you have to match the, the treatment risk with the disease risk. And, and those are things that, um, uh, you know, your primary care doctor and if necessary, a urologist like myself can help you with. Dr. Kim, thank you so much for putting this together. I apologize on time, but I mean, you gave us a lot. There's some very graphic images there too. <laughs> ah. Ah. Hey, um, I'm going to somehow convince you to share those slides with us. Are you cool with that? Uh, I've already emailed them to Jennifer, so she Good. can post them for all, uh, all of you guys to look at. Good, we'll have that on the portal. Dr. Kim, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, one of the top prostate doctors in America and he's part of the metal gang. So it's good to have him part of our group.